Thank you. Let's just adjust this a bit. Greetings, everyone. Um, I've been listening all day, so it's been some fantastic conversations. So I'm just going to be sharing a provocation on reparations, which is a topic that is very, very popular these days. Okay? So I just want to share some perspectives on what reparations are because I don't assume that everyone has the same understanding of what reparations are. But the key thing to note is that from the perspective of many of those who have been researching and um, organizing for reparations, there's no universal kind of definition or understanding of the meaning of reparations, okay? And so each community that has been harmed as an affected community, according to their own historical experience and their own cultures, their own cosmovisions and worldviews, define reparations to suit their own liberation thrust. And reparations also should embrace the knowledge systems, the epistemologies of those affected groups. So for those of you who are involved or thinking about the connections between fundraising and investment and philanthropy and reparations, there are some key principles that I think are important to bear in mind. It's important, therefore, to recognize and act on the definitions, the principles, and ethics of reparations that affected groups and communities are advocating. At this time, many institutions, many even institutional wealth holders, private wealth holders, are beginning to embrace reparations, or repair as some of us prefer to say, but not always with the best of practice. Oftentimes, the knowledge producers, those who have actually been championing this cause, often for centuries, are marginalized, sometimes subjugated and excluded. So when thinking about the meaning of reparations, we have to recognize that reparations are not simply about redistributing resources or the transfer of wealth um, or equalizing of wealth for affected groups and communities. According to the United Nations basic principles and guidelines on a right to a remedy and reparation, uh, which was really sort of formulated in 2005, bringing together kind of hundreds of years of principles and practices around reparations, there are five key aspects of any holistic reparations framework according to international law. And I begin with the stopping of the harm. So we've been talking and various ones and ones of you have been emphasizing the harm, the harm of dominant funding models, the harm of the dominant economic system and models and how that is creating inequalities, further inequalities in this system of um, polycrisis that we have. But there must be a stopping of that harm, a cessation of the violations of that current system. You cannot really begin to effectively repair unless you stop the continuum of harms. And this is not just about what happened historically, it's about the impact of that history which uh, we've heard about today on contemporary populations. So stopping of the harm is the first principle. Then there is this notion of what's called restitution, which is really a full restitution process would put people or a group back in a position they would have been in, but for chattel enslavement, colonialism, imperialism, etc. And in many instances, full restitution may not even be possible. And then there's this notion of compensation, which is what everyone kind of jumps to when they think about reparations. But compensation is not just about money, but it is about how we put a so-called economic value on harm. But it can also entail, not, as I said, not just money, but in terms of the transfer of resources, the value of lands, the value of trade justice, etc., etc. And then there's this notion of uh, satisfaction, 
which is known as symbolic reparations. So satisfaction are uh, removing statutes to colonizers and changing the curriculum and changing street names. And sometimes it might involve legal actions against corporations that are polluting the environment today, for instance, as a legacy, that ecocidal legacy that also accompanies a genocide. And then there is the rehabilitation, which speaks to the need for healing for affected groups and communities. So this is the basic UN framework on reparations. And most reparations uh, uh, policies and procedures and initiatives emphasize compensation rather than aspects such as the guarantees of non-repetition, which is how do we ensure those harms don't get replicated, not only for the specific community or group, but for other people as well. Then there is something called the Belfast Guidelines on Reparations in Post-Conflict Societies, which outlines good practices to inform uh, you know, reparations measures uh, that civil society actors, uh, funders, institutions may take. And it really gives practical guidelines on how you will implement a reparations framework. So within reparations movements, of which there are many, um, there are, as I said, different notions of what reparations look like. Uh, speaking from somebody who is part of the International Social Movement for African Reparations, not only do we recognize international law, we recognize a framework that is called the Chinwezu framework that really emphasizes that reparations is about repair. The root of that word comes from repare, meaning to repair. And those repairs must be holistic. Self-made repairs are a key part of reparations. And a lot of the resources that should be happening should be recognizing the actual self-repairs that communities and affected groups are taking to rebuild themselves, to re-establish their agency and their self-determination. It's also mental, psychological repairs, cultural, organizational, institutional, social, uh, economic, technological, political, family repairs, repairs in our group relationships relationships as well as our interpersonal dimensions and repairs to the reputation of uh, groups that have been um, defamed and slandered. Just for instance, like a whole category of people that I come from in terms of my African ancestors being classified and just defined as slaves, as though they had no humanity, no civilization and no culture before chattel enslavement. But the key thing to emphasize coming from many uh, re uh, reparations movements from uh, not only African heritage, but indigenous peoples, is that reparations is seen as a, a transformative thing. It's seen as a way of not only transforming our own situation as groups, but also how we can transform and rebuild the world. And in that regard, Professor Malena Karenga, who is an African ethicist, articulates that reparations is a process of the repairing and the remaking of a people who are in the process and the practice of repairing, renewing, and remaking the world. And for genuine uh, reparations to occur, not only must the harms must be stopped, but we must also seek to transform the dominant capitalist colonial economic models, which are driving further harms, such as the harms of the climate and ecological crisis. And we have to think about what repair looks like in the context of not only polycrisis, but social environmental collapse, which speaks to the uneven ending of our current means of sustenance, shelter, security, and identity. And that is why some of us as reparationists have been articulating a holistic approach to reparations that recognizes harm that has not only been done to peoples, but also the harm has been done to our very relationship with Mother Earth that sustains all of our lives. And in that regard, uh, we champion the notion of planet repairs, which refers to when safeguarding the rights of past, present, and future generations, there is a need to proceed from a standpoint of pluriversality that highlights the nexus of reparatory justice, environmental justice, and cognitive justice 
in um, articulating the impetus to repair holistically our relationship with and inseparability from Mother Earth, the environment, and indeed the pluriverse, giving due recognition to indigenous knowledges in contrast with uh, Western-centric Enlightenment ideals that have separated humanity from nature and thereby justified exploitation for capital accumulation. I'm, it's important for me to state that reparations, like the term decolonization, is not a metaphor. It is not about using this term to describe equality, diversity, and all these other initiatives and everything else that we want to do. Reparations are a remedy to um, correct and redress harms and wrongs that have been committed against groups and peoples and indeed our Mother Earth. And so they are really about trying to redress those injustices and imbalances that are there in society between and within groups. But as I said, not everyone may be using even this term reparations. And it's important to recognize the different goals that reparations movements have. Uh, this includes transcending racial capitalism, narrowing the racial wealth gap, but oftentimes that discourse and analysis looks at the racial wealth gap in the global north, say in the United States of America and here in the UK, but it doesn't look at the global wealth gap in terms of the impact of imperialism on different parts of the world. And to truly narrow the wealth gap, we would have to have a global uh, rebalancing of the wealth gap. It includes radical wealth redistribution and notions of what's known uh, and referred to by many indigenous people as rematriation, land back, sovereignty back, but it's not just about the land, it's about our kinship, it's about our ceremonies back, our languages, our cultures, our heritage, our life ways, our waters, our plants, our uh, relations, uh, our ancestors back. This is a holistic notion of what reparations looks like. And uh, it's, it, it's really key then to look at some of the principles in developing reparations frameworks and policies, programs, and initiatives. It's important to recognize historical and contemporary struggles and movements who have been working on social and reparatory justice. Uh, be informed by these movements. Don't just do your own thing. Find out what communities want, what they're working on, what their goals are, what their aspirations for repair are. It's important to resource uh, also uh, movement building, uh, which restores the agency and the political self-determination of affected groups and communities through enabling their own participation in uh, self-repair and wider societal repair initiatives. And of course, strengthening equitable partnerships. Uh, remember that uh, one of the key slogans that is actually inspired by disability rights organizing, but is particularly used by Ova Herrero and Nama communities, is nothing about us without us. Anything about us without us is against us. And that principle applies to recognizing that communities uh, and their own advocacy groupings must be in the forefront of shaping, of, of delivering and driving and monitoring and evaluating reparations uh, initiatives and programs. We should move beyond grant making to embracing uh, reparations as a restitution of resources that have been pillaged, looted, extracted, and stolen from communities. And so this is not about funding. This is about restitution which is one of the key principles of reparations under international law. Finally, um, a couple of examples where uh, this good practice is happening. There is the Decolonizing Wealth Liberated Capitals Case for Reparations Initiative in the United States of America that is resourcing actual movement organizations uh, that are championing reparations for African uh, heritage communities in America and uh, Native American communities as well. 
There is obviously sun setting models that have been spoken about today and various uh, philanthropic uh, institutions have been doing that. I advocate a model called sunrising, which is whereby um, you know, institutions uh, see themselves as being conduits for the restitution of those stolen and extracted resources for affected communities. And so instead of a sun setting, there's a sun rising where those resources are then utilized and redeployed into movements of those who have been harmed, not only historically, but in the present. There are voluntary reparations models that some philanthropic institutions have began to embrace, of course, informed by movements. And there are notions such as community land trust that recognize the collective rights of communities to try and build the alternative visions, the alternative institutions and economies that are needed to actually transform themselves. There are even uh, indeed reparationists who advocate uh, financial transaction taxes, such as the Ubuntu financial transaction tax uh, promoted by Keval Baradia. Key things uh, in my closing to avoid, which is what is happening right now in the sector, uh, there's a lot of red flags that are appearing. So as the movement for reparations and movements and campaigns for reparations become more successful and more visible, there is movement capture, okay, that is happening. And often this occurs where funders use their financial leverage to redirect the purposes, the goals, even the structures and strategies and political agendas of reparations movements. And that goes with elite capture where you often get social, political, economic, academic elites who are well positioned to redirect reparations resources to suit their own uh, narrow uh, and class interests in terms of programs and initiatives. And, and we are seeing uh, as a result of that a lot of counterinsurgency, which is actually diverting the goals of reparations movements that is about fundamental social change and transformation. Uh, and so uh, reparations is becoming co-opted. Uh, I'm out of time, uh, and I'd just like to uh, thank you for your attention and listening to me.